Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm so glad to be here at uh, LeBitConf. This is my fourth. I think I've only missed one. Um, a huge thanks to Rodolfo, who opened us up with such passion and enthusiasm. I understood about half of it. Because, um, because he speaks very fast in Spanish, and my Spanish is still at the Duolingo level two standards, right? So I'm not going to be doing my presentation today in Spanish. Maybe in two years. Maybe in two years. Every every now and then, I, I try and practice a bit with Duolingo, and you know, it pops up little nice reassuring messages like. Um, more Americans are studying foreign languages on Duolingo than in the public schools in America. Great statistic, right? It would be true if only two people were using Duolingo, uh, because they don't really teach foreign languages. <laughs> but you know, we're trying, trying there. Um, Spanish will be my fourth language, and uh, I hope I can I can get it to the level where I can order food in a restaurant without embarrassing myself. That's where we are at the moment. So, not ready to do Bitcoin quite yet. Um, I'm really excited to be here, uh, and I would like to talk about a topic that keeps coming up with Bitcoin, and that is black markets. Ooh. Black markets. You see, the thing is, Bitcoin is used for black markets. You've heard that? Yes? It's used for black markets. And, uh, of course, it's also used for some white markets, too. Uh, in Argentina, it's used for some blue markets. That's what they've renamed their black markets, because it's such a big part of the economy. They want it to sound a bit more palatable. But really, Bitcoin is colorblind when it comes to markets. It doesn't distinguish between black and white markets, or blue or gray, or any of the other colors of the rainbow markets. Right? It just serves markets. So the real question is, what is the difference between a white market and a black market? And is the color a good metric, a good way for us to understand the functioning? of markets. I think it's a very poor metric. I think that calling a market a white market or a black market doesn't tell us much about what that market does and how well it works. Now, the people who use terms like that would really like you to think that there are a whole set of associations that go along with that color. White markets good, black markets bad. White markets legal, Black markets illegal. White markets functioning. Black markets not functioning. White markets fair. Black markets unfair. White markets safe. Black market unsafe. White market moral. Black market immoral. Bullshit. Not a single one of those statements is true. White markets and black markets differ in one and only one essential component. White markets are licensed. Black markets are unlicensed. That's it. Black markets can be moral, safe, just, fair, and efficient. And simultaneously, white markets can be immoral, unfair, unjust and inefficient. We all know this. Implicitly, we know it. The taxi cartel is a white market. Uber is a black market. I won't take a bloody taxi. Because I've been to 53 countries, and I've been robbed by taxi drivers in 52. <laughs> the airport is here. My hotel is here. Let's go that way, on triple tariff with seven extras that I just invented. This has happened to me in every country in the world. Why? Because it's a regulated, licensed guild, a cartel. It's an inefficient, broken market full of corruption. And Uber works. It's efficient, it's fair, it's transparent, but it's the black market. 
We don't call it the black market, because if it's run by a multinational corporation with nice graphics and a stock market index, we don't really want to call it the black market, but it is, if it's not licensed. Right outside this place, there are little electric scooters with lime colors, really cute. Have you tried those? They're so much fun. You can go 15 miles per hour on the sidewalk or on the street. I'm sure one of the two is illegal, but I'm not sure which one. You have to wear a helmet. I didn't. I'm sorry. That was probably illegal. And the actual service itself is not licensed, so that's a black market. In North Korea, you can only have one of six haircuts if you're a male. Which means that this is a black market, too, because it's not one of the approved <laughs> haircuts. Okay, calling it a haircut, it's just the result of hair loss, but still, I, I'd like to pretend for a few more years while I can. But the bottom line is that there's nothing essentially moral about white markets, and there's nothing essentially immoral about black markets. General Dynamics selling 500-pound cluster bombs to the Saudis is the whitest of white markets. It is not only legal, it is strongly encouraged, and I pay for some of that with my taxpayer money. Is it moral? Hell no, it isn't. Right? The person selling bananas on the street without a merchant's license is the black market. Is it moral? Hell yes, it is. Using Bitcoin to escape a collapsing currency in Venezuela is highly illegal and is the black market. Is it moral? It's a human right. It's not just moral. It is the obligation of a parent to protect the safety of their children. That is protected under the UN Convention for Human Rights. It is illegal, with heavy penalties. All of the rest of the things that Maduro is doing, white markets everywhere. <laughs> Perfectly legal, fully licensed, completely broken. So the difference between white and black markets is an issue of licensing. And what is the natural state of markets? The gray, the big gray in between. Gray markets don't emerge, they simply exist. Meaning that in the absence of any other form of market, all markets are just gray. How do white markets emerge? You have a gray market in place, and someone gives it a license. Now it's a white market. You have a gray market in place, someone makes it illegal. Now it's a black market. But markets just emerge. They emerge any time two individuals, without coercion, of their own free will, decide to transact in a commercial manner, agree on a price that they find commonly beneficial, and they transact. And that's a market. That's it. It doesn't have a color. It didn't require permission. It doesn't need a license. It is a natural human activity that occurs everywhere, every time, throughout history. But we want to invent these new terms in order to somehow provide color to these markets, legitimacy to some, illegitimacy to others. And what is the trajectory of every white market? Every white market starts off as a gray market, then it gets licensed. And initially, the licensing is probably sold to you as a way to enforce some kind of standard of good behavior or quality. After all, you would want your doctors to be licensed. They always go back to that one. You would want your doctors to be licensed. In some states in the United States, 10,000 or more professions require a professional license. In Louisiana, the amount of hours you need to do to become a cosmetician that does nails exceeds by four times the number of hours you need to become an emergency medical technician who works in an ambulance. And if you try to do nails without a license, you will be arrested, because you are operating in the black market, or red, or teal, or French manicure, or sparkly. Which one you choose is up to you. But you certainly don't have the requisite license. And gradually, guilds form. And guilds are professional associations whose primary purpose is to make sure there isn't any competition, to keep out those who would deem themselves to be professionals and try to emerge.
into the market, like the taxi cartel. Right? So these licenses gradually become guilds, where it's just a matter of can you afford to buy into it the quality standards, the certification, the regulation, the rules, all of that gradually disappears into the background. The regulators stop doing those things, and they focus primarily on enforcing the rules. People forget why those rules exist, and it simply becomes a professional guild. If you can afford to buy the necessary license, essentially to bribe the government to allow you to, to work, then you are part of the white market. And all white markets devolve into that state. And over years, maybe decades, maybe centuries, you arrive at absurd situations of concentration of wealth and power, where, as a random example, you might have seven families controlling every business in a country. The fundamental difference between markets, white or black, should not be the measure of how well they are licensed. We should care about whether they are fair, whether they are open, and whether they are free. In fact, if they are open and free, fairness arises as a result of the open and free nature of these markets. If you don't like it, you can trade elsewhere. And competition ensures fairness. But here's the other little subtle thing, which is that absent a license, without a white market, the government, the state, withdraws the services of justice from the market. This is critical to understand, because until now, the monopoly on the delivery of justice services existed primarily in the government sphere. Governments provide justice as a service, J-A-A-S. Let's use a tech term. And their justice as a service API is only available for a certain fee to certain people, yes, and it's usually broken and it takes seven years to fulfill a request. But nevertheless, they do offer justice as a service. But if you step outside of the white market, now that justice as a service is removed and you get exposed to the full risks of operating in a market where you have no justice, you have no recourse, you have no ability to settle disputes, and where violence becomes the solution. Ironically, sometimes that happens even in white markets. I walk out of the airport in Chile, straight into a line of taxi drivers who see me looking at my phone, and they go, Uber? Sorry. <laughs> and what do I do then? Do I go to a cop, stand next to the police officer going, taxi drivers? No. Because every country I've been to, the cops are working with the taxi drivers to beat up the Uber drivers and their passengers. Because not only have they removed justice as a service, they're now delivering injustice as a service as part of a competitive blockade. So you don't go to the cops, because that's too dangerous. Okay, so I don't get my Uber ride. What's the big deal? But think about all of the markets in which justice has been removed as a service, where you cannot enforce property rights, where when you go to the arborito in order to change your currency into another currency, you may get counterfeit money. What do you do? Call the police? No, you don't call the police. You can't call the police. That service has been removed. And you can go to more funny situations like the experience most high school students have the first time they go try and buy marijuana from some dude on the street. And what they do is they get a bag of oregano. <coughs> and they don't know any different, so they're like, I don't think I should smoke this. It smells like a salad. Now what do I do? <laughs> do I call the cops? I can't call the cops. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. The illegal drugs I just bought are not correct. Ironically, some people do that. They go to the police and say, this cocaine isn't good. <laughs> and they soon discover that that's a bit of a problem. Again, that's a little funny story, and you think, well, they deserve what they get. After all, they're breaking the law, so they should be punished. Now think about the immigrant cleaner who had their passport taken from them by the coyote who traveled them across the border who is now holding their passport hostage, and they are terrified to go to the police. And they live in a locked compound with bars on the windows, and they cannot 
exercise any of their human rights, because they are kept as virtual slaves within an industrialized society. And that happens today in the United States by the hundreds of thousands of people. Slavery is on the uptick all around the world. Why? Because the act of being an illegal human being, I don't even know what the fuck that means, has resulted in the removal of justice as a service from an entire category of people. And apply that to sex workers who are engaging in acts of consensual sex or prostitution and things like that, or even just people stripping or making funny movies. They no longer have justice as a service. As a result, violence, abuse, rape, domestic abuse, massive problems in any illegal industry. And those black markets that do emerge, where the need is great for the existence of a market, where the amount of demand is going to cause the emergence of supply, whether that's capital flight from Argentina, whether it's recreational drugs, whether it's whatever else you might want to find in a market, if there is no white market, the black market exists, but it charges a massive risk premium sprinkled with a heavy dose of violence. Until now, justice could only be provided by government services. You cannot enforce property rights without a court, or can you? Huh. What if we used a very large number that we multiplied against another very large number on an elliptic curve, and what if that crazy idea would allow me to enforce global property rights. What if I could use a smart contract in order to create a matching service between buyers and sellers that ensures there is no forgery, no fraud? What if I could use a smart contract to escrow the money in the process of a buy of any product, and now I can ensure that I don't get cheated? What if I could use a smart contract in order to do reputation services? just like Uber does, that gives me a great degree of comfort, but without Uber, without the centralized company. What if I could get justice as a service from a network? And that's what happens. And now the world has changed, because now it's not a distinction between the licensed market, where you have some justice, and the unlicensed market, where you have no justice. Bitcoin doesn't care, Ethereum doesn't care, blockchains don't see colors. They also don't see borders, and they don't see people. They only see rules, and they can deliver justice as a service no matter what color your market is. White, black, gray. Bitcoin, blockchains, Ethereum, all of these different tech technologies serve markets. They serve markets wherever there is supply and demand. They serve markets globally, without distinction for borders. Because here's another little secret that you don't remember, which is that justice as a service only applies within a specific geography. The Chilean justice provider only works within the borders of Chile. Now, what can you do with that information as an individual? Not much. What can multinational companies do with that information? Oh, they can screw you in 194 different countries. And unless it's in the one you're in, you don't really have much recourse, but then again, they also bought all your legislators, so you don't have any recourse in that one either. But blockchain justice as a service works globally because it doesn't care whether you're inside or outside that border. And there's this other little thing which we often forget, which is when people say, but that product is illegal. To which your first question should be, illegal where? Legal and illegal are geography-bound terms. Illegal where? Illegal here? What if I'm not here? What if I'm in that country? Is it legal there? What's legal here? What's legal there? These are highly relative notions. and They imply a strong morality component that you may not share. Is it legal to buy a Bible? Not in Saudi Arabia, it's not. It's also illegal to drive in Saudi Arabia unless you have both of the licensing requirements as a driver. A driver's license, 
and a penis. Well, until recently, because they fixed that one, so now you can drive theoretically without one, but you might get beaten up by the cops, because they're protecting their morality, not my morality. Is it legal to buy certain substances? Is it legal to buy bombs to bomb another country? Again, legality is bound by geography. Blockchains are not. So with a blockchain, you can enforce justice across borders. You can enforce justice across the world. And you can enforce justice whether you consider the market within the narrow scope of your own country, white or black, gray or blue. Blockchains serve justice, and as a result, they can deliver free and open markets worldwide that are fair. Does that mean you can use blockchains for the black market? Hell yes, it does, because there is a demand for that. And make better white markets? Yes. And everything in between? Yes. It is not about white. It is not about black. It's about free, open, and fair. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, really great to be able to see you um, on live. Finally, oh, thank you. After all these years, um, my yes. question is about how will you be able to enforce justice as a service uh, from a blockchain service? Doing that, if the there is a monopoly. On force, but also on um, regular justice, like um, a judge is also a monopoly on currently on the state. Well, again, the word enforcement contains the word force, but does it have to? And how much of our current commercial transactions really require that level of recourse where you have force? You know, force is a commodity that you can um, apply. Uh, to a certain degree, but once you try to apply it to too many people on too many things for too many reasons, then you have to pay the people to apply the force. And fortunately, by that time, we have messed your currency up so well that you can't pay the enforcers. Uh, Venezuela, for example. Um, I, I watched this great uh, video the other day, which showed some of the uh, enforcers of Maduro smiling in front of the cameras, holding the uh, privileges of their position, which were two toilet paper rolls. That's how far low their payments for the enforcement services become. How far away from the moment when they go, this is so not worth it. Right? And so enforcement and force is always an aspect of human condition, and it's always an aspect of human society. What we're talking about here is being able to enforce justice through rules that can be agreed on by everyone in a consensus system without violence. This is the non-violent mechanism for enforcement. And it's primarily financial enforcement. And it works primarily through a series of incentives and financial punishments. Game theory. And what we found through markets and um, game theory in general is that those mechanisms work better. Because they don't expect people to be good, they only expect people to act in their self-interest. And if everybody acts in their self-interest in a system of rules that punish, good be uh, punish bad behavior and reward good behavior, um, then good behavior emerges naturally from the system. I don't know how well it's going to work. Let's build some things and test them out. Um, I certainly know that one of the beautiful things about operating on digital platforms like the internet, and one of the reasons why people arguably want to do things like run drug markets on the internet is because you can't get stabbed over TCPIP. Okay, next question. I think there was one in the back, right? Oh no? Okay. Over there? This gentleman. Okay. Gentleman Someone asked the a question. Anyone with a microphone? Go. A question Wait, here. Who got it first? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I want to ask you about black markets, red markets, and banks. Yes. You know we have so many problems with banks, the risking and the whole thing. Let me know what you think about that, because it's, uh, it's part of the control. Well, I mean, that's the final culmination of a white market, when the rules that start off to be consumer protection eventually become banker protection. 
Um, and as a result, they become protection from competition, which leads to a guild. And once a guild gets powerful enough and organized enough, we have a different word for it. It's called a cartel. And we don't use the word cartel to refer to banks because they have such a big cartel. <laughs> um, but the problem is that banks no longer um, serve many of the important f uh, functions that you expect banks to serve. They don't bank people. Uh, in fact, the number of people who is unbanked. Um, is is not decreasing now that we're 25 years into the internet. They're not serving this. I was doing a presentation um, at a conference, a security conference that was full of bankers, and I was describing how um, Bitcoin, as a form of money, can serve populations that are doing remittances to foreign countries, but which don't have bank accounts because they are not properly documented. They're illegal immigrants or migrants into a country, and as a result, they can't open a bank account. And right now, they're paying enormous fees to be robbed by the gray market of uh, Western Union and check cashing services and things like that. And during my presentation, this lady in the back said, "But why should we give bank accounts to illegals?" And at least half of the people in the room were decent enough to go, <gasps> but the other half were really interested in the answer. And I said, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Don't. We will. <laughs> okay. One more question. Hi, Andreas. Here. Hello. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. And thank you for being a great teacher and inspiring thank everyone. You. I think I speak for everyone. Uh, my question is about blockchain, not in general, but as an educator myself, you know, uh, I'm trying to battle uh, every startup that says blockchain and it doesn't do blockchain. It doesn't mm -hmm. do decentralization, disintermediation. It just uh, does database. Yes. Uh, what's our, our recommendation to us to battle that movement, you know, to call blockchain everything and do not do innovation and decentralization. Well, you don't need to battle anything. What you need to do is remove your attention and interest from these projects because they serve no purpose. So you have to ask yourself when you hear this, when someone says, "My project has blockchain." Well, actually nowadays what they usually say is, "We are introducing a revolutionary new system of blockchain plus artificial intelligence plus Internet of Things that uses neural networks to woo, give me money. Um, and at that point, you stop listening, or you ask, is it borderless? Is it open? Is it neutral? Is it global? Is it censorship resistant? If it's not, you don't need a blockchain. Those are the features provided by open, decentralized blockchains. So ask those ask the five pillars, the five questions. If it's none of those things, then it's a database. It's a centralized database. In fact, what it is is a very inefficient, very slow, very expensive, difficult to develop database with a really shitty user interface. Um, and you know, <laughs> in the era of Microsoft databases and Oracle, it takes a lot of effort to produce an even shittier interface. Yeah. <laughs> so the bottom line is, this is not a good technology solution for anything if you're not looking for those features. And do you need to fight that market? No, no, don't fight it. Let them spend a hundred million dollars training developers, consultants, paying the development of this industry while producing bullshit. And then, once that project fails, and the developers in that project will look around and go, "Well, what do we do now?" Well, I heard about this other project, and I'd like to work on that. And they go work on an open source, real, open, decentralized blockchain. And I started saying this in 2013 that they will train the developers, and then those developers will one day discover Bitcoin and all of the other open blockchains and go, "These are much more interesting projects." And then, when I was visiting Singapore, it happened for the first time. I sat down next to a kid who said to me, I'm really excited. This is my first Bitcoin conference. Uh, and I watched one of your videos, but you know, I've been working in blockchain for a year, and I hadn't heard about Bitcoin until yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> How? Tell me more. <laughs> 
<laughs> this I want to hear. So I went to this presentation by Bank of America a year ago, and there is this whole presentation about the centralized ledger technology. And eventually, at some point in the slides, they mentioned the B word. No, not that B word. The other B word, blockchain. And they told us this would be the greatest technology. They managed to go through all 30 slides without mentioning the other B word at all. And then this person worked with Hyperledger and R3 and all of these other technologies in the DLT space. And they were interesting, but not that interesting. And then one day they discovered Bitcoin and were like, whoa, this is where it came from? This seems very weird and a bit exciting. <laughs> And we gain one more developer, perfectly trained and ready to go. They just need to re relearn some of the basic concepts, and they're good to go to build a nice open source project. Don't fight that market. Let them waste bank money on trying to co-opt, embrace, and distort the ideas of what we're building, and then run straight into the wall of their own centralized, sclerotic, dinosaur organizations. And then the project fails to deliver anything, and it's chopped by the board of directors, who are no longer impressed by the word blockchain. And the people take their Christmas bonus, and on January they open a startup with the same money the bank just gave them in order to compete with the bank. They pay for their own demise. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Great. Um, okay, time is up. Stay here. Andreas, oh, yeah, okay, your books. people who asked questions, mm -hmm. um, please come and see me at the edge of the stage here. I would like to give you a copy of my book. Internet del Dinero is the Spanish edition of this book. And um, I'm going to be signing books tomorrow after the fireside chat. If you want to see me then, I would be happy to sign a book for you. Thank you so much. And Andreas, we want to sign you something else. Oh, wow, this is uh, you as Mr. Bitcoin Superman. We will auction this off on the last day of the conference for a good cause. Okay, and fantastic. This is by artist Luis Ventura. Please sign it with your, with your private key, please. My pleasure. <laughs>